Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender, where we take a deep dive into the most important economic issues facing agriculture. I'm your host, Carly Jacobson. David Widmar and Brent Gloy are back with us from Agricultural Economic Insights, along with Chris Nielsen, a financial services officer out of East Central Iowa region. The vast majority of business owners have a business plan and they can articulate producers are really no different. And for some producers, the plan's in their head. For others, it's a multi-page document. So today's conversation isn't specifically to tell you what the perfect answer is, but rather to remind you why it's important and provide suggestions on how to create a living resource and a communication tool. So Brent, I know this is a favorite topic of yours, so I'm excited to get this kicked on over to you. Yeah, thanks, Carly. It is it is one of uh, a topic I enjoy talking about because it's one of those things that um, if we do it, uh, it can have a pretty big impact on your business, and it's it's pretty useful. Um, it can also be done so it's not very useful, and, and we want to avoid that. So uh, today we want to talk about a business model, business plan. So we want to start, I think, with a little poll, and uh, we want to ask, does your farm have a business model or plan? A, no. Yes, it's uh, regularly, you know, prepared and updated. Yes, it's part of our archives. It's in my head or uh, it's in someone else's head. I'll tell you that uh, I've had a lot of different experiences with uh, business plans. Uh, you know, when I was at the university, we were really good at uh, writing business plans or strategic plan documents and you'd spend, you know, months working on them. And then uh, they would kind of go in a big fancy binder and sit in people's uh, desks and probably uh, never be used again. So, uh, so I think, you know, it's not surprising to me that we see a lot of people don't have uh, a business plan or model because I think they have a little bit of a, uh, Oh, what do I want to say? A bad uh, reputation. I think it's undeserved. Undeserved. So, I want to talk to you today about uh, why we feel that way and uh, how you can get started in an easy, simple way, which is what we're going to show you today. And I really like this quote, and this is one of David's favorite quotes uh, by Lewis Carroll, who um, put together Alice in Wonderlands, and uh, says, "You know, if you don't know where you're going." any road will get you there. And uh, that's kind of convenient, uh, but it's not really what we want to do with our business. We kind of want to have an idea, and I think we all do have an idea where we'd like to be in you know, the next year, in the next couple of years, or even five to 10 years down the road. And so it makes sense to, if we have that vision in our head, to go ahead and uh, Put it in a plan so that we can uh, we can make sure that we're making progress toward that goal. So business models are, are really just uh, conceptual tools that kind of tie together all of your business. So from financial performance to our goals and plans and tactical and strategical strategic efforts. So think about you know your financial goals and what your business goals and future plans might be, and then the activities that you're gonna use to get you where you want to go. And we think that those things are best if they are updated, uh, shared, and detailed. And they can be a lot of work. And uh, we're gonna give you a simple template today, but as with most things, once you get started, they can be really useful. And so we like to start simple. Uh, it's kind of one of my themes is, you know, let's take baby steps toward a goal and just keep progressing uh, toward it as we get there. And one of the reasons we think that uh, having been able to update it and share it is useful because it kind of tends to bring alignment with all of our stakeholders. So <clears throat> when these things are most useful, I think, are when we're looking at different alternatives. And a lot of us in the farm business, these are kind of common things. We might want to start by thinking about, oh, hey, we've got another generation that we'd like to bring into this business. That's something that a lot of people take a lot of pride in in agriculture, bringing that next generation into the business. In order to do that, we pro oftentimes have to start thinking strategically about what are some of the different options that we might be able to use to bring in that 
that next generation. Uh, also very useful when we start thinking about, hey, Maybe there's something else we should be doing, a new enterprise we should take on, or maybe there's something that we're doing today that, you know, we really just are wondering whether we should continue to do it. And obviously, a lot of these kinds of strategic alternative discussions take place around uh, a time when we want to grow our business, but that's not just the only time. It's also helpful and just kind of making sure your business stays relevant, even if you're not in growth mode. And it can be super helpful in thinking about, hey, here's my transition plan toward a situation where maybe I want to retire or do something different. Uh, it's also very useful to help us work with our partners, including our lenders and accountants, uh, maybe your agronomists or other uh, key partners that you have in your business. It can help you communicate what it is you're trying to do, uh, and what your strategy is. And I think it's really useful in, in maintaining that strategic clarity. And what we mean by that is everybody has a shared sense of where we're going, what we're trying to do. And that can be really useful uh, so that everybody's kind of got that same goal in mind. You know, if the team is going, you know, some people are going in different directions, it can make it really hard to be successful. The other thing is that these things play out over a long period of time. And David and I were just talking about that earlier before we got on this webinar of how much things can change in a decade. And I challenge you to just step back and think about, you know, where your business was 10 years ago, uh, what you were doing, what you were concerned about, uh, and think of how different that is today. And uh, these business plans and business models can be really useful in helping you make sure that you're proceeding to to the road down the road that you want to go down. We're not just taking the road of convenience. And Brent is <clears throat> reminding me of that. Uh, Eisenhower quote about plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And this is really what we want to get you to think about is the plan in and of itself, you know, has value, but uh, it's the effort of planning. It's the process of putting that together that really creates a lot of that value and it really challenges your thinking. So the framework that we wanted to set up and introduce and discuss today and even provide a little bit of a case study of how you might be able to use this and see how it um can play out. It's called the the business model canvas. There's this great book called the business model generation, and I call it the it's a coffee table book. So it's a book that you you never keep too far away from you. Mine's always in my desk or bouncing around the back seat of my truck. Uh, it's a book that you know you kind of get stuck on a problem, and you can pick it up. You can read about the the issue you're thinking about. Maybe it's revenue streams or cost structure, or maybe your key partners. And then you can find a lot of great examples from businesses we all know, like Google or Microsoft or Amazon. So this book is, you know, widely used. Um, this is an idea that, you know, Brent introduced me to over a decade ago, and it's even more popular today than it was uh, back then. There's a lot of resources even online. But what the business model canvas is really great about is it takes uh, a business plan or a business model. And I think we all have this stereotypical business plan in our mind that's 10, 20, 30 pages of, you know, text, lots of text and lots of words. Um, and it takes it and puts it into a, a one page overview. Uh, and this one page overview makes it really easy for you to tweak, to update, to share, to get buy in, to get feedback. And so it's just a really great uh, starting point. And and it doesn't necessarily, you know, give you permission to skip writing the formal business plan. You still might have to do some writing. You still might want to uh, get more specific and more detailed in your business plan. But this one pager really allows you to make a lot of progress really quickly. Sketch out the sketch out the forest before you have to focus on the specifics in any one of those details. So we're going to set up what this looks like. We're going to introduce it, and then we're going to give you an example of how it starts to play out. So. This is what the canvas looks like, and you can print it off. I saw some examples of people, you know, putting it on a whiteboard or putting a big version of this on their wall in their office and, and, and getting familiar with these different, these nine different boxes. And this is, these nine boxes is a way of putting kind of 
all the key elements into your business into nine different bins and being able to see them in one spot and being able to think about how can we improve, uh, where are our weaknesses, where are our strengths, and where might we adjust these as we move forward. So we broke this into three sort of subcategories. I want to introduce those ideas to you. So the first one that we're really familiar with, especially if you're longtime listeners of Two Economists and the Lender, is the revenue and the revenue streams and the cost structure there in the bottom. And so what's great about this is that you capture what are those revenue generating activities that you have in your operation and what are those major cost structures and it allows you to start putting some maybe some key uh, performance indicators that you follow or maybe some key metrics that you use that makes you a bit unique and different than other operations in your in your neighborhood the second category the second group of boxes here in the top left are the three that all have the word key in it so there's key partners key activities and key resources and the idea here is what are the uh, assets or the relationships or the um, processes that you do that allow you to generate those income and so this is sort of that that maybe the engine of the business that you have going on what are those things that you have going on that allow you to to do the things that you do and the next box over here i'm going to turn this over to brent but this is really centers around that value proposition yeah david and and part of the reason i really like this idea in that book is because what he basically says is people spend lots of time talking and philosophizing about business models and what they are. But at the end of the day, all businesses boil down to the kind of these nine areas. And so you can take these nine areas and kind of describe uh, your situation through this simplified uh, approach. Now, one of the key things and the reason it's bigger on there is the value proposition that's shown right in the center. And what what that is is you know thinking about who is your customer okay um what uh are you trying to do what is the problem that you're trying to solve for your customers or that we're trying to uh fulfill for them in order you know in that key customer target and then what is our offering so what do we sell them what's the product that we sell them uh not only what it is but how we sell it to them so think again who's your customer and i think it's important for us to remember uh in agriculture that we all have customers we we don't talk about them uh, as much as say uh, a main street business might but they are the people that generally write us checks for our products and then you want to think about what is your relationship with that customer look like is it a transactional relationship where you know they post a price and we say yay or nay or is it a deeper relationship is it a personal relationship that we have with them what uh, do we get them through the internet do we you know how do we access and keep that customer relationship and then channel is kind of how our product gets to the customer how what do we use to sell it uh, and again, for agriculture, we don't think about these as much usually, but, you know, if we're selling commodities, they're going into that channel, but we might also be selling specialized commodities or um, products that have to be delivered in a certain time and a certain quality. And so what is that channel that you're selling uh, your product through? And then finally, you know, how can we think about our customers? We have different types of customer segments, or are we primarily focused on one type of customer? So that's kind of the overlay or the overview of that business model canvas. But now let's take a second to just think about uh, an example. And, and David has put one of those together for us. So David, I'll let you start that. And before we dive into this, I just want to remind folks that, you know, we might be talking about this idea for a semester on campus or, you know, multiple days at a workshop. So we're giving you a bit of a high level starting point on this. So this is kind of a starting point if you want to pursue this. But the example that we started here is, is a, an operation that's looking at expanding to the next generation. And currently, their focus is on that landowner relationships. They cash rent a lot of acres and they really focus on having a strong relationship with those landowners. The other thing that they really focus in on is delivering uh, the grain 
both corn and ethanol plant and soybeans to a crush facility. They have quality grain that they're able to deliver in a very timely way. They're sort of the on-demand user. So when these plants get low, these are the phone calls. Uh, they get the phone call and say, hey, can you deliver corn in a very timely fashion to keep these plants at capacity and keep them running? They're able to you know, really capture some basis on that in that model. What they're considering as they add this next generation is adding a contract swine feeding enterprise. So it's a way for them to add some labor and, and, and generate some additional income. So let's uh, let's fill out this this these nine boxes in the canvas and give you an idea of where they stand today. So cost structure uh, at the bottom left there is the cash rent a lot of those acres. They have debt service on some farmland they own, but also on the machinery that they use. They have the inputs on a cost per acre basis and, and their labor is mostly family. This is probably a, a cost structure that's familiar to a lot of folks watching today. On the revenue stream, they're they have the value of the corn and soybeans produced and they keep an eye on the returns to grain storage because that's a huge part of that their efforts. So when we think about those those top left it, uh, that quadrant, those key partners, key activities, and key resources. They have their input provider through the co-op. They have their lender. They also have key partners with the ethanol plants and the, the crush plants. And they also have those landowners. You know, their activities are planting and harvesting the grain, but also hauling it and marketing it throughout the winter. And the resources they utilize currently are those owned and rented acres along with their grain storage. And then when we jump over here to the value proposition, they have uh, they're, they're paying competitive uh, rent and while improving soil health, and they're also a timely deliver delivering in a timely way those quality commodities. And their focus on those relationships is with the newsletter, prompt payments, and they use word of mouth in the farm website for their channels. And when we get to the customer segments, you know, when they think about the land that they're renting, they work a lot with those retired producers or those who've inherited acres. And then when they're selling the grain, they're thinking about those those end users as their, their key segments. And this, I think, is an important part here where agriculture is sometimes a little different a lot of times that value proposition we're talking about people we sell to but their viewing is um providing some landowner services to the people they rent that land from so they may not be getting a check for that today but they're trying to differentiate themselves around uh some of the services they provide to those landowners which i think is important to think about so what we're going to do now is we're going to add here, uh, build this out a little bit, and they've done a lot of thinking and work. It's okay, if we add this uh, this hog enterprise, what does this look like? Well, let's go back to the cost structure in the bottom left. Uh, the green there, they now have to service some debt on some facilities. They might have to add some some labor to, to get uh, – all the labor that they need. They also have a new revenue stream with the sign contract payments that they're going to get. When we think about their key partners. They got to they got to develop and maintain a relationship with a, a contractor, an integrator. They also now have another key activity of feeding and caring for those hogs all year round. They also now have a key resource of those facilities. Okay, we're going to switch to the other side of the, the, the model here, the top right. Maybe there's uh, that value proposition is being able to use that manure that ties in well with that soil health component. And also they might be able to provide fertility updates to their landowners as part of that relationship that they're building, that service that they're building with those landowners. They're going to have more of a conversation around that because they're using that manure and they're doing a lot of sampling as part of that. And it's interesting because herein lies some of the tension, though, that you get too, because they're trying to take on a new activity that's going to require them to do stuff all the time. Uh, one of their ways they've built their customer relationships is through um, being able to be really timely with their with their customers. And so this kind of helps you get a sense for, okay, um, we're adding a whole lot of stuff here on some of these activities and resources. How is that going to impact some of the things we're already doing? And this is just another example of, you know, this is just one example. You can imagine they could also build this out for maybe they want to add a custom spraying business or maybe they want to add a cow-calf operation. You could see how they could take their base operation today and they can kind of keep iterating and editing to see how does this line up. So in one case, as Brent was saying, you know, this hog winner might fit in really well with those those relationships they have with the landowners, but it might conflict with their ability to, to deliver that grain on a timely basis. If they're you know, all their days filled with feeding and caring for those hogs, they might not have as much capacity for the rest of that. So this is where the real value of this, this business canvas comes together is you can see this in one spot and you can start to communicate that. So 
before we get to our lender conversation here in the second uh, part of this episode, I wanted to provide you some some ways to get started, some, some motivation and some tips for getting started. And the first one is, what makes your farm very unique? I think it's very common for folks, they introduce themselves, say, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a farmer, I have some raised corn and soybeans and have a, have a little bit of livestock. And that might capture a lot of people who are on the webinar today, but we want to get really specific in these business models. You know, and one way you can um, really distinguish yourself or one small distinction could be, you know, do you haul your grain through the winter or do you work with somebody else to do that? Is that a key activity or is that a key relationship that you manage? Another one is livestock versus grain. Which one's the biggest revenue stream and how has that changed over time? And a third consideration of how it makes you unique is what cost maybe do you manage better than anyone else in your neighborhood? Which one are you really focused on and are you really uh, keeping the pencil sharp with? Another tip here is what relationships and assets are critical for your farm's success. You know, if you're going to lose an asset or if you're going to lose a relationship, which one's going to keep you awake at night the most? Capture that in your business model, start to manage that and create uh, some details around that that you can share with your internal and external stakeholders. The third point here, how has your farm changed over the last 10, 20, or even 50 years? By stepping Stepping into a reflecting mode, you can see, oh man, how much has our operation really changed over these time frames? It can start to allow you to think about, okay, how does that define what our operation is today? And how have we how have we, you know, transitioned over time to become the operation we are? A couple of points to keep in mind. Mind, remember there are no right or wrong answers. Uh, these are trade-offs. These are sort of a strategic evaluation. As we talked about with that earlier example, um, this exercise probably isn't going to give you the the check you know the litmus test either yes or no outcome it's going to unveil a lot of the pros and the cons that allow you to make a more informed and better decision and finally keep in mind that business models are always this work in process there's always going to be some iteration and some adjusting and tweaking and the, we think this canvas tool is really helpful for doing that and i think one of the hardest things to do is to write a 10 or 20 page document you know spend a lot of time doing it putting it on the shelf and we just kind of want to frame it right we want to always have it there bound and never uh mess with it but with these business models as, as Carly said at the introduction, they're living. We need to get, they need to use them. We need to update them and adjust them. So this canvas is really helpful for doing that. At this point, it's really exciting to invite uh, Chris to join us. Chris has helped us prepare for this. We're really excited to have his conversation. And he's going to stick around for the overtime Q&A. So make sure you get those questions submitted through the portal. But Chris, I want to first thank you again for joining us. And uh, have you introduce yourself a little bit to us. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, David. Uh, like you said, my name is uh, Chris Nielsen. I've been in lending for 16 years now, of which uh, the last almost three years I've been with Farm Credit Services of America. I live north of Cedar Rapids in a small town called Walker uh, with my wife and three kids. Seems like uh, we're pretty crazy busy chasing all those three at the same time. Um, at Farm Credit Services of America, I serve Lynn and Benton County. Uh, here in Eastern Iowa. And like I mentioned earlier, I've dealt with all aspects of lending, whether it be uh, consumer or commercial lending, but uh, my passion's always been in agriculture. So I have to ask with all your experience, did the poll surprise you about the percentage of growers having a business model? How does that line up with your in the field experience? I don't think it surprised me at all. all I think all five of those answers are uh, are viable. You know, in some way, shape or form, I think all our growers and producers have a business plan. It's just a matter of, you know, how they account for it. The new adage now is, uh, you know, to be a successful operation, we need to spend more and more time uh, behind the desk and maybe less and less time behind the wheel of a tractor or in the feedlot. But uh, that being said, uh, you know, behind the tractor is where we get a lot of this stuff done. Um, we can do, you know, so much now through technology. So going back to the question, you know, I would say that most of my growers have a model, uh, but I think most of these models are, you know, more in their head. Um, they can rattle off the revenue streams and their knowledge of the cost structure is, you know, really strong and they know who their car key partners are and they know what their key activities are. They just uh, and they have those customer relationships. It's just more, you know, getting it down and documenting it. What do you think is a common barrier for producers to pursue a more formal version of that that business model, that business plan? Right. I, I think I think most of the barriers really to form a business model or, uh, you know, a business plan is, you know, for growers to really, you know, leave their comfort zone, trying, uh, you know, just trying to get a business model down into a document is a lot of it is just kind of where to start. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the content is there, the model is formed, just, you know, getting it down and documenting it. 
So with that lender's hat on, let's say you meet with one customer in the morning that has a business plan and one in the afternoon that doesn't have a plan. What is the, the most common advantage that you see for operations that do have that plan that's documented? Uh, I'd, I'd say, you know, the biggest advantages that I've seen with operations that have a business model or a business plan that they have prepared um, is, that the, is that they're prepared. You know, at Farm Credit Services of America, we are big components of annual financials. Um, if you have a loan request, or even if you don't, an accurate financial statement is key to monitoring your operation success. Um, creating a solid trend in your operation is key to knowing the success of your operation and uh, where changes maybe need to be made. Um, the business plans should mirror those financials. Um, if you have a solid foundation of financials in your operation that correlates to that business plan, then say if the tractor needs replaced or that 40 acre piece comes up for sale next door, you're already prepared to make that decision as opposed to scrambling to decide, you know, if the buy is right or not. Um, having someone like me as your lender or your agronomist, your seed dealer, et cetera, um, those are key partners in this business plan. Um, but, you know, these key partners or key resources um, can help you along the way and get you to the point for you to make a sound business decision. Business decision uh, but we cannot be your conscience when making that decision. Um, the annual financials, the key relationships with your key partners and a sound business plan all uh, contribute to make that smart, you know, sound decision in your operation. And we have a webinar in July is going to be about that bench of advisors. So having that document kind of helps you and it helps those advisors uh, help you navigate that kind of having all everybody on the same page there. I was wondering if you could share a couple of examples of maybe some operations that you've worked with that have significantly changed their business model over the last several years and, and what they've done and how that's played out for them. Right. And we kind of highlighted it earlier, but, uh, you know, the most frequent example that I get, you know, when I get changing business models is when, you know, one growing uh, the operation in terms of families being supported by that operation. One example I have is an operator had a, a row crop operation of about, say, 1500 acres. Um, his son wanted to come back to the farm as well. And the biggest question for this operation and one that, you know, many farms have today is, does this size, is this size of farm big enough uh, to support, you know, two families? Um, that made the, the that made uh, the business decision that it was and was not. So they ended up expanding uh, the operations row crop through smart growth. They did not go out and buy high prices ground, um, but were real competitive in the market. Um, they added a hog confinement building to the operation where they uh, rented the pig space out to uh, a local integrator. And that was uh, busy work that added some income to that growing operation. They also added a small breeding herd um, that really diversified that operation as well. There was enough added work and revenue there uh, uh, to justify the move and the growth and be able to support, you know, added families to that operation. Um, another example is, uh, you know, a customer that feeds hogs. In prior years, they would be purchasing their feed. Uh, but they increased their row crop operation uh, side of things where they could grind their own feed and feed it to their animals, um, increase the everyday work side of things, but improve the bottom line in the process. So uh, same goes for, you know, grain hauling, uh, hauling grain to the processor as opposed to taking it to the local elevator, like we mentioned before as well. This shows that these business plans need to be dynamic and they need to be able to change as long as it's good for that operation. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, we've covered a really big topic in you know, just 30 minutes here. So um, I was wondering if we maybe missed or uh, missed anything or if there's anything that you would like to really uh, make sure we producers kept in mind as they think about their own operations and their own business plans and, and taking a step in, in getting those more developed and more formal. Uh, to say to say if we missed anything, I'm not I'm not sure, but there's a lot of information into these business models. Uh, but I don't think, you know, we can stress enough the communication that you have to have through your plan to your key partners or your business partners in these operations, whether it's your family who's a part of the operation or others that are part of the plan. Uh, being able to communicate these plans and being, being able to have them change as the operation evolves is, is really key. Well, this has been a, a lot of great advice and a lot of great uh, insights. I appreciate that. I have the one last question. It's the billboard question. If you could put a billboard up for thousands of producers to, to see and reflect on here in May 2023, uh, if there's a different piece of advice than what you've already added, what would that be, that be today? I would to say a, a billboard. Uh, I would just kind of go back to how this started, how I started. I think 
keeping an accurate financial statement that pairs with a sound and dynamic business plan sets up sustained success for any operation uh, that can take advantage of the highs, but also be, be being prepared for when the things when things don't go right. So, you know, agriculture is a, a relationship based business and we can all really learn from one another and learn from each operation. Well, Chris, that's great. Thanks so much. And Carly, we're at the 30 minute mark. So we're going to kick it back over to you. Brent, what have you got for us today? I think the useful part of what we've given you today is a framework. And that framework is kind of gets you off of that blank page that David talks about a lot. So you've got nine areas you can think, start thinking about and start describing what you do in those nine areas and, and give yourself uh, a kind of way to, to, you know, get started, uh, for lack of a better word, on something that I think, if you do it, can really help improve your business. And Brent, one thing that I'll add, and this is coming from my personal experience, is if you pick up the canvas and you start sketching some stuff out and you realize there's a blank area or a part that's a little lighter, it's kind of an area of your operation where you probably need to spend more time thinking about it. So it's going to be a kind of a way for you to um, self-illuminate uh, maybe areas of the business that need to be, you know, thought about more critically or more developed, or maybe you turn to your trusted advisors for input on. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I do see one now. What if I'm not the one making the decisions in the op- an operation there's a uh, very active older generation i don't feel like i hold the keys to write the business plan and i th- i think that's a pretty legitimate concern um in in something that i think we can uh that this can give us a tool to just start asking questions, give you a framework to start asking questions and you don't have to write it, but you can, you can start by asking questions and and trying to start an open dialogue on, on some of these issues. Um, I, I don't know, Dave, if you have anything to add to that. I think it's what you said, Brent, spot on. It's the idea of starting the conversation, starting the dialogue, maybe, you take the first draft at filling in some of the blanks and then you have that conversation and say, hey, what is our value proposition? That's probably one of the hardest questions that I think is one of the hardest boxes, I think, to you know fill out. Is it going back to that case study farm? You know, is it the relationship we have with the landowners? Is it the relationship we have with the end users of the, of the grain that we deliver to? And just having that conversation, filling that out just a little bit, and you'll be surprised how how much um, great dialogue can come by just having um, a blank page and working together to fill that out. And, you know, start with your current status quo and then start thinking about, hey, should we add this hay business? Should we add this custom spraying business? Should we add this hog? So get kind of that foundation started with where you are today. And then you can start thinking about iterations and moving those forward. So I see a question now that says, have you come across a business model where an investor leases land and custom farms it? And I guess the, the way I would say is, um, as David was talking about the farm and how you describe your farm, well, I'm a corn and soybean farm, but that doesn't really tell us much, does it? Because you can go to a hundred different corn and soybean farm and they would all do something different. They all do it slightly differently. Every, nobody does it just the same. And so uh, I think we've seen pretty much every type of um, business out there. And so, yeah, we've seen investors that lease land and have it custom. Or I haven't seen too many people that where somebody in, leases it and then has it custom farm, but they might have pieces of it custom farm. So, um, yeah, I think there's all kinds of different ways. And, uh, that's one of the, one of the cool things about farming. This, uh, question, Chris can probably provide some, some background on, um, uh, what about accrual basis financial statements? Are they necessary or is cash better? And, um, uh, I just put in the plug. And I said I, I think both ty- financial records are really important, and uh, we want to have good, accurate cash basis financial statements and and records, as well as accrual adjusted 
financial statements to give us a picture of how the business really looks on a year by year basis. I would I would agree with you, Brent. Biggest thing, uh, you know, say on our end is just creating, uh, you know, an accurate trend year over year. Um, um, that's a, a lot of these financial statements is, as we have that trend and how's, how the farm's growing. So, you know, I prefer a cash basis, but, you know, as long as we have that, you know, accurate trend, I think that's important. Yeah, and I, I just think, you know, it, it, it's critical to keep good and accurate records so you know what's going on. And um, without that adjustment, sometimes if we're doing a lot of things with inventories and, and other things from year to year, it can kind of distort our view of of how profitable we were or weren't. Um, but, you know, the cash, accurate cash statements are required to get that all started. I see a question about how can uh, viewers get a copy of the canvas. We'll share the PowerPoint slides here, and there's a, you know, there's a starting point for for that. You can Google it. There's a lot of uh, resources online, also in the book. But as you'll notice, it's just those nine boxes, and you can sketch those out uh, on your own sheet of paper or on your own um, whiteboard and get started at any point. But yeah, we'll share the PowerPoint slides with the follow up. That'll do it for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender. Thank you to Brent, David, and Chris for leading today's conversation. And for you in the audience, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you online again next month.